from recording in progress. Director All India for Medical Sciences, Bulgaria, sir, and the panel. All, all Good afternoon. Good. Let's start. Yes, sir. So, Love, sir, is busy in another meeting with Honorable Minister. He will be joining in some time now. I will request you to kindly welcome the participant and start the session today, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, let me take this opportunity to welcome all the uh, doctors who have logged in to this Center of Excellence uh, program on monkeypox management being conducted jointly by the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi, and the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. Um, as we all know, the last uh, uh, this year, there has been an outbreak of monkeypox in non endemic areas, and WHO declared it a uh, an emergency of concern, a medical emergency of concern uh, because of the number of cases which were increasing in non-endemic area. Monkeypox is not a new disease. It was uh, discovered in monkeys in way back in 1958. And the first human case was there in 1970 in the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's, some, it's an illness which has been there in Africa for a long time, Central and Western Africa with two clades. But it has only occasionally or I'll say rarely gone beyond the continent of Africa. There's been one outbreak uh, in the US, which caused a little bit of concern, which is related to Gambian rats uh, being transported there. But by and large, it has let, had few human cases. And the human to human spread is not as uh, good as we see with COVID-19. So I don't think it's a cause of concern. But at the same time, it's an issue to be vigilant because the number of cases are increasing. And therefore, we need to have, know about the epidemiology, how do we diagnose it, what are the available uh, treatment strategies that are there, and what can we do in terms of infection control, both from healthcare uh, personal point of view and from the patient point of view. So these are the issues that we will discuss in the, on, uh, in the uh, subsequent webinars. Today's webinar is basically looking at global burden of disease and epidemiology, trying to give you an overview as the first starting point. And then we'll come to investigation, clinical management, prevention as we go along in the subsequent webinars. I have with me a panel of experts. I have uh, uh, Professor Kaushal Verma, who is the head department of dermatology and venerology at the All Institute of Medical Sciences. Professor Anand Mohan, who is the head department of pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine. And uh, 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 the coordinator would be Dr. Rajiv Kumar, as far as questions are concerned, the Associate Dean and Professor Neurology. Now, it's important for us to be able to understand that because there are some uh, concepts which are important to understand, especially from the dermatological point of view and from the, I would say, venerological point of view also, because of issues that have come, especially as far as the global cases are concerned. So without wasting much time, I'll ask uh, Dr. Anath Mohan to make this presentation and then we will have questions. You could put the questions on the chat box or later on, if you really want uh, to ask something which is very urgent, try and raise your hand and we'll try and see if we can then ask you also to uh, answer these questions. I can see that um, uh, Mr. Lavagarwal is also possibly joined. I just saw him briefly. So if he's there, maybe he can also just uh, give the introductory remarks and then we can have the talk by Dr. Nand Mohan. Uh, thank you. At the outset, uh, let me uh, uh, thank um, uh, respected uh, Director Ames and all the colleagues who have taken up this initiative in supporting us uh, on uh, orienting uh, the medical professionals on monkeypox, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, I think, you know, the challenges one by one, they are all coming and uh, it is important that we all remain abreast with respect to what needs to be done at the field level. And uh, you're all aware we had this uh, concept of National Center of Excellence, wherein AIMS Delhi has been our National Center of Excellence. And there are uh, every state we are requested to nominate one institute as a state center of excellence. Beside that, we also requested our colleagues from IMA. And this time when it came to monkeypox, we have also requested our colleagues from IADDL also to join in. Uh, while we had this ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, this has emerged, monkeypox has emerged as a new challenge. Uh, my only request is that uh, we feel that we can manage this challenge comfortably well if we are aware what this disease is about and uh, what type of treatment and uh, you know approaches need to be followed. And that's where this uh, webinar is going to be very useful. And we have these four webinars which we have planned out uh, on a daily basis, uh, which AIM Delhi will guide us through that process. 
Our request is that uh, whatever we discuss today, this kindly should also be disseminated through you to all other police, particularly at the uh, cutting edge level, primarily in the districts or below district level also, because this is particularly important. We can manage the disease as long as we are aware what we are dealing with and what type of clinical management protocol needs to be followed. So that is what we would request you to kindly focus on. We also need your help in terms of ensuring that there is no unnecessary doubt or unnecessary panic which is created within the community. My request is this is particularly important. And uh, in terms of making the community aware as and when as patients they come to you, what type of protocol is to be followed, what type of precaution need to be taken, particularly focusing on isolation and symptomatic management. And I'm sure uh, Dr. Anand Mohanji will explain in greater detail. So without uh, uh, taking much time, I would be once again thanking all the panelists uh, who have joined here today from across the country and also our colleagues from AIMS uh, for taking this initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll ask Dr. Anand Mohan to make his presentation and uh, can do the slide share. Okay, chat box we call them. Uh, thank you very much and uh, welcome to all uh, for and thank you for attending this uh, webinar. So as a kind of a new disease uh, now which is emerging, uh, I'll begin today by just talking in brief about how it all came about, the epidemiology and possibly whatever is the global burden as, uh, as a whatever we know till, uh, till date or in the last couple of weeks, whatever has happened. So to start off with, Monkeypox is actually a zoonotic disease, which is caused by what is known as the monkeypox virus, and we'll see what type of a virus that is. The disease usually in humans uh, causes mostly constitutional symptoms and predominantly cutaneous and skin or skin manifestations. So far, we have had at least three outbreaks outside the traditional Central and West African regions, which were traditionally considered to be the, uh, the main endemic areas where monkeypox was seen. Before the start of the current outbreak, three outbreaks, small outbreaks have occurred even before, but now this one, since the last two months or so, appears to be slightly on a larger scale. The origin of this virus basically is to the rainforests of Central and West Africa, where it is now more or less endemic. Firstly, this was identified in the late 1950s, and that was in the laboratory, in the lab monkeys in a lab at Denmark, and then it was subsequently found in many rodents as well. The first reports of human infection actually came almost a decade later in the 1970s in, in the Zaire, which is currently known as the Congo. So if we look at the timelines of uh, monkeypox over here in the last uh, 40 to 50 years or so, and if we can see, okay. so if we can see that uh, the whole thing started somewhere in the 1970s, where the first initial cases were detected and then uh, sporadic cases were seen, you see uh, n is equal to 1, n is equal to 2, 6. So over the next couple of years and one or two decades, sporadic cases were seen somewhere around the Ivory Coast in Cameroon and other countries. And then in 2003, the kind of a first major outbreak, relatively major outbreak was seen in USA where 47 cases were detected. And then subsequently over the next two, three years in Sudan, and then again in um, uh, Sierra Leone, and then that is just solitary case. So that is how it has been panning out in the last 40 to 50 years. It's so sporadic cases here and there, and one or two small outbreaks. As far as the virology is concerned, what type of a virus is this? It belongs, the monkeypox belongs to the genus uh, Orthopox viridae, and this is basically a double-stranded DNA virus enveloped, uh, a brick-shaped uh, in, in a way, measuring between 200 to 250 um, and microns. It replicates mostly in the cytoplasm and not really in the nucleus. So that is just a little bit of basic microbiology that I'll give over here. And as already mentioned, it has caused two, it, it has two different clades basically till this particular uh, outbreak has occurred. And that was in West Africa and that was in the Congo Basin. So these are the two, uh, the WB and the CB uh, clades are there. Traditionally, WB uh, clade was less virulent as compared to the CB, but uh, that was all, almost in a couple of cases only. What about the reservoir? If you look at the whole transmission cascade, the uh, reservoir actually is not 
not fully identified it is likely to be mostly rodents and monkeys actually like humans are also incidental hosts they are not like the definitive hosts and apart from that many other non human primates have also been known to host and also they have been known to get infected by this uh, monkey pox virus that includes squirrels rats dogs and uh, monkeys of course and so, so several other rodents are uh, pay, playing host and they are also playing the reservoir and as said natural reservoir is not fully identified again likely to be rodents although we are not 100% sure about that so if you look at this kind of uh, transmission cascade we can divide it into two types one is uh, how transmission occurs in an endemic area and the other will be how it occurs in a non endemic area so on the left side if it is if we see in the endemic area then mostly the transmission occurs mostly for from the animals to humans and of course from animal to animal as well and as we see from the the rodents or the animals they are transmitted to the humans and from the humans they are transmitted to other household or other close contacts in an endemic area and if we have a kind of a traveler coming from some other place to that endemic area so then obviously he is exposed to the infection and he takes the infection back with him to wherever he is coming from and that is where and then he goes to a non endemic area if you see on the right side of the slide that is the, then he enters a non endemic area again he comes in contact with his own contacts and there are various ways by which which this can be transmitted we look at that whether it is through clothing whether it is through droplets through skin touch or uh, through infection through surfaces contaminated surfaces or it is face to face uh, by coughing etc so he transmits to others in non endemic area thereby causing the outbreak in that particular so this is broadly speaking how this whole thing has happened so here animal to human and human to human there are two types of uh, infection transmission that may happen from animal to human usually occurs by bites and scratches from infected animals to humans or to those people who are in the business of preparation of meat are higher at risk those who are at close contact or are exposed to secretions of infected animals are also at higher risk and eating inadequately cooked meat also has been found to confer some higher risk of transmitting the the infection so this is the infection from animals to humans in a way from human to human again it is mostly it is because of proximity so it is direct skin to skin contact with the lesions or the body fluids of that particular of a person who is harboring that virus and this includes to a strong uh, in, in fact sexual <coughs> contact is quite a strong risk factor for this kind of a, a transmission as we shall see indirect contact can also occur with contaminated fomites and then again any kind of close physical contacts with an infected person or large droplet uh, large respiratory droplets all also modalities by which transmission can occur occur although if we compare with the sars corona the covid this requires longer and uh, longer and more prolonged face to face contact as compared to the covid so it is not as though a couple of minutes may be sufficient whatever we know so far appears it appears that we need a longer much longer period of contact close face to face contact for this kind of transmission to occur and also there have been some reports saying that it can trans if there vertical transmission is also possible so a pregnant female may transmit the infection to the fetus as well so coming to the current outbreak what is happening since early may 2022 there has been an accelerated epidemic of monkey pox and uh, increased number of cases throughout the globe and there therefore who declared monkey pox as a evolving threat or moderate public health concern on 23 june 2022 and this if we see the global map how it has all panned out traditionally as we know it is mostly the blue dots you see are the ones in in africa where already it is supposed to be endemic but it is the orange or the yellow dots you see all across which are the ones which are non endemic areas and how they have now started showing more and more infections you can see the the big cluster in the europe uh, europe area so that is where a large number of infections actually came up and have been still being reported then in usa again there is a large cluster and then it is scattered in fact almost all the continents so north america south america europe is there and now it is spreading even in australia and sporadic cases now are being seen in other parts of the world including asia and southeast asia as well so it is that is why it is now becoming a global outbreak of concern and if you see this uh, global map which was uh, updated as on two days ago and we can see the number of confirmed cases 
so far are in excess of 30000 and the, the, the interesting or the concerning finding here is that only 345 of these are actually reported in countries which are historical endemic sites for monkeypox most of the other cases are reported in countries which never had monkeypox monkeypox in the past and the locations are total 88 locations have been um, uh, affected so far again out of these only seven seven are the ones in countries which are traditional endemic countries and all others the majority are outside that so this just means that it is no longer localized to only one or two areas uh, in africa but now it has become a it's a, a global problem so in the end, I'll just uh, quote this one paper, this uh, very scarce data so far is available as regard the clinical profile and demographics of monkeypox uh, it's early days yet. But this was one paper which came up in the NEGM and this was based on a uh, London based collaborative effort in which they collected data by contacting peers in various countries and made a observation and descriptive kind of a study. And if you see, they included 528 patients with the monkeypox infection. And you can see the, um, the demographic, mostly they were young and uh, the median age being around 38 years. And one reason for that probably now is being explained that monkeypox is very similar to smallpox. So those people who were already vaccinated with smallpox uh, 20, 30 years back probably are more immune, but the younger people who are not, not uh, immunized with smallpox probably are more at risk. So that is a theory which is now going around and that is why most of the people are younger age group. The gender, more of the, most of them are uh, males as you can see again. And again, the important thing here would be that uh, the, basically the sexual orientation uh, play, uh, plays a very important role here. And you can see 96% of the people had a homosexual behavior. There it is. So this is again a very kind of a very strong feature which are risk factor going towards the development of this disease and also almost 40 percent of the patients were retrovirus positive from this particular cohort then coming to the uh, the microbiological confirmation and also uh, you know many of them a significant proportion of them were having some other sexually transmitted infection present almost 29 percent and you can see that included gonorrhea chlamydia and syphilis and some cases of herpes simplex and others as well. So they go hand in hand with other sexually transmitted infections. And then the rest of all the, the data, as you can see, is related to the travel in the last couple of in a uh, couple of weeks. So one fourth of them had some foreign travel and, and the rest of it already is uh, there. The route of transmission, again, like already mentioned, 95% of them are suspected to be having <laughs> route of transmission through sexual contact. And uh, the clinical features, among the clinical features, the commonest clinical features were rash or skin lesions and two third of them had fever, lymphadenopathy and then a small minority had pharyngitis, headaches were quite prominent, exhaustion, myalgia, fatigue was also very prominent. So all the so constitutional symptoms were there in almost 30 to 40 percent of the patients. So, so the case definitions as of now as regard the monkeypox are as follows and these are the WHO definitions. They can be classified as a suspect case. This is one who has an unexplained acute rash. Along with that, he has some constitutional symptoms like headache, fever, myalgia. He has lymphadenopathy or back pain or weakness. And we also exclude other common causes of sexually transmitted infections or exanthematous react reactions or skin rashes. So once we exclude that and we have these uh, above two uh, features, then we call it as a suspect case. Or it may be a probable case. A probable case is one who fulfills the criteria of the previous slide of a suspect case. Along with that, he has some kind of an epidemiological link to a probable or a confirmed case in the last three weeks before a symptom onset. That is a confirmed case of monkeypox. So this may be in the form of a prolonged phase two case exposure, direct physical contact with skin or skin lesions, including sexual contact or with contaminated material like clothing, bedding or utensils. So all these risk factors or um, the modes of transmission, any of those must be present. Or he has had multiple sexual partners in the last three weeks or on uh, laboratory findings, if some antibody testing has been done, he has detectable levels of uh, relevant IgM antibody in the last four to 56 days after the rash onset. Or one can demonstrate a fourfold rise in the IgG antibody titer also and on in two time points that in the acute phase and in the convalescent phase samples 
and so if these are there then he becomes a, a probable case of monkey pox or if he has got a positive test result for the um, ortho pox viral infection this is by means of a pcr or by means of a sequencing that is the next generation sequencing and of course a confirmed case will be one in which he has a lab confirmed virus uh, which is detected either by means of the the viral dna by real time pcr or by means of a gene sequencing performed by means of a next generation sequencing so this will be a confirmed case uh, as of now these are the current definitions so again a definition of a contact has also been uh, highlighted and and defined by the who and this is any person who in the period beginning from the source case first symptoms and which ends with all when all the scabs have fallen off because the infective period starts one or two days prior to the crusting and once everything has dried off then he is called to be non infective non infective so any person who has any of these risk factors most of them we have already talked about physical direct skin to skin physical contact or bedding surfaces contaminated material face to face exposure <coughs> or inhalation of some other material like clap uh, crabs uh, sorry scabs or crusts from an infective person all these also are risk factors for a contact if he is in contact with a confirmed monkey pox so these also apply for healthcare workers who are potentially exposed if they have not worn the appropriate uh, personal protective equipment so that is also to so those who are working in those labs or those who are in contact with these patients etc so that applies to them as well in the last slide uh, because of, uh, uh, today we will be focusing only on the kind of uh, epidemiology and the global burden i think in the next two or three sem uh, seminars we will be looking at other features as well so the incubation period is also quite variable the time from the entry of the virus to the onset of the symptoms currently it is said to be between 3 to 20 days mostly it is between 6 to 13 days uh, generally speaking and the period of infectivity is basically the time from the onset of symptoms to the time when the rash has fully healed and a fresh layer of skin is formed and typically this is approximately of a 2 to 4 weeks duration so this may be the period of infectivity in general so i'll stop here and uh, i think uh, after that we can so thank you ro yeah so thank you uh, dr nandmohan for an excellent coverage of the global burden of disease and giving us an idea of how monkey pox has evolved uh, over the last 50 years or so from its first being discovered in 1958 to the current situation of the outbreak that we are having in 2022 uh, there are also guidelines which have come from the ministry of health and family welfare and government of india uh, as far as the case definition and management is concerned so it's important to even look at that because they also uh, uh, sort of focus on history of travel also so if there's a history of travel in the last 21 days to an area where there is an outbreak or an endemic area of, of monkey pox then one should have a high index of suspicion and also look at diagnosing multi monkey pox early also some uh, there are some case reports of eight typical presentation where the rash occurs much earlier normally the rash occurs usually on the fourth to fifth day unlike chicken pox where it can occur earlier but there are reports that sometimes the fever and rash occur simultaneously so it's important to have a high index of suspicion before we go on to the questions i'll just request uh, professor kaushal varma to give his comments especially on the issue of the sexual transmission of the disease because that is also a cause of concern that can we actually call it an std or do you think that is something which is related to close contact yeah uh, thank you uh, professor galeria and thanks dr nandmohan for nicely reviewing the epidemiology and the global burden of the disease since majority of the cases have been reported in people who have had close skin to skin contact and that has been in people who had a high risk sexual behavior so i think it's more important to have a close skin to skin contact than uh, solely calling this as a sexually transmitted infection the other situations also can happen when the infected person come in contact with a healthy person or the person who is not infected and if the skin to skin contact is there whether it is sexual or non sexual it is likely to transmit the disease specifically if the skin is compromised in sexual contact what happens is the physical contact of the skin to skin and then there is a mucosal contact also so that's what i believe is making more susceptible to the person to transmit the disease or the person to acquire the disease but contact is important it's a face to face contact when the secretions are saliva or the body fluids are getting exchanged 
we are not certain if the virus penetrates this impact skin, but it does uh, transmit through the mucosal surface. So if the breach in the continuity of the skin is there in a person or a person who has got compromised skin for whatever reason, whether it is an inflammatory skin disease or he has got erosions or ulcers or maybe some infective disease where the skin is compromised or the skin failure situation. In those situations, skin to skin contact, even if it is non-sexual, I, I think the transmission of virus will take place. So it's more important to understand the close contact rather than the sexual contact. It so happened in this epidemic that most people had uh, sexual contact and they acquired the infection. So it is getting labeled as this is becoming a sexually transmitted infection. I think we need to wait for this to see that it is actually a sexually transmitted infection. And we have also has seen that many of these people who have been identified with monkeypox supposedly acquired through the sexual contact had several other sexually transmitted infections also. So if a person is having sexually transmitted infection, the other viral infections can easily occur like we have seen in HIV infections. Or if the person has got herpetic infection for that matter, and if he's getting exposed to another say virus or maybe the bacteria, they have more chances of acquiring the other disease also. So to say that it is purely uh, sexually acquired infection or sexually transmitted disease, I think we need to wait and see that it is actually a sexually transmitted infection. Right. Thank you very much. So I would tend to agree with that. I think the take home message that I would want wanting to actually emphasize was that this is not purely a sexually transmitted disease. The reason why is this is being highlighted is that if you look at reports from the West, it's being predominantly reported in MSA, men having sex with men. And it is said that probably it is a sexually transmitted disease occurring only in that group of patients. As a matter of fact, some people even try to say that it doesn't occur in women because it's only in uh, in that group of patients. But I don't think that's true. Close contact is important and close contact hap uh, happens much more in that group where it's a close-knit group and that's why it seems to have developed a pocket of infection in that area. But I don't think it's a correct statement to say that this is a sexually transmitted disease. It can be transmitted through sex, but it is predominantly also transmitted through close contact with, uh, with an infected person, especially when it's mucosal contact or if it's related to uh, exposed uh, skin with the, the skin rash and the pustular formation. So I think it's very important that we don't get biased, but keep an open mind when we start suspecting cases and don't really just go from to the sexual history, but also take a history of close contact. So this was the point that I just wanted to highlight. It's important in the epidemiology because if you look at the data which Dr. Anath Moore also presented from the US, majority of patients, I would say more than 90%, if I'm not mistaken in that, were, were actually in men having sex with men, which gave a wrong impression about the disease and the current outbreak, which I think needs to be corrected because that is probably not true. It can be transmitted or possibly be transmitted through the sexual route, but there are other important issues that we need to keep in mind. Close contract, uh, a large droplet infection through mucous membrane and through skin. So just wanted to highlight that. Uh, we can, I would now request uh, Dr. Rajiv to uh, uh, take over and go through the questions so that we can uh, answer the questions and maybe if there's anyone in the group who would like to give a comment, we could also have that. Thank you, sir. So there are, uh, this is for the uh, information of everybody who's attending the webinar. There are two types of participants here. There are certain people who are panelists. If they wish to speak or raise a qu say a question, please turn on your camera and raise your hand and you can be invited to speak. The attendees will only be able to ask questions by putting them in the chat box or in the Q&A box. So if they have a question, they need to type it there. Um, so we'll begin with some of the questions, sir. The first two questions relate to the epidemiology, and that is what is the infectivity rate and what is the case fatality rate? So do we have this data at the, as of now? What is the infectivity rate and the case fatality rate? So what is the infectivity rate and what is the case fatality rate? Anand's going to answer so, that. Actually, right now, the infectivity rate is not very clear, you know, because the number of cases are not that high and also most of them is not but one has not really followed them up, followed them up in a way that one can say how many people will infect, how many people subsequently. But we do know that there is actually again, again, uh, we have to remember that the only series which I showed, the published series, is actually kind of biased. I mean, it is biased towards the you know HIV positive people and those who had the sexual orientations. 
but that doesn't mean that it cannot happen through respiratory but infectivity rate right now has not been kind of calculated if, if i may put it that way but the case fatality rate as of now has raised anywhere between uh, earlier it was 0 to 10% before this outbreak it used to be 0 to 10% in this particular outbreak so far it is somewhere between 3 to 6% so far again these are all very very early data so we still need to you know look forward yes so i don't think we have sufficient data there are some studies which have looked at the infectivity rate and probably shown it to be low, very low, probably less than 1.8 or so, if I'm not mistaken. 0.7 to 1.3%. 0.7 to so average is around 0.8. Mm -hmm. As far as the mortality is concerned, uh, remember Anand showed you that there are two clades, the Central African and the West African clade. The current uh, outbreak seems to be more from the West African clade, which also caused an outbreak in Nigeria. And if you look at current some data, it seems to be sim the current circulating virus seems to be similar to the Nigerian clade, which caused an outbreak, I think, in 2017. This is associated with a low mortality, which is uh, much lower. One to six percent is what is quoted in the literature. Uh, so we are the current out the current uh, um, virus is actually associated with low mortality and ha has a low infectivity rate. But we need more data because it's still an ongoing outbreak and how this virus behaves as compared to previous outbreaks is something we need to understand because it's happening again in areas, as was mentioned, which are non-endemic. Bulk of your cases are occurring in non-endemic areas. So the mode of transmission, the mortality in this population is something that we need to be able to understand because this has implication both on how aggressively to, to treat and what should be the long-term vaccination strategy if we need to start looking at that in terms of um, and we'll discuss that in the subsequent uh, webinars. Over right. to you, Rajiv. So the next question is about the mode of transmission. So is there any evidence that it's transmitted through the intravenous route? Needles, fluids, blood? I don't, I've not, I've not come across uh, any clear-cut confirmed report of uh, transmission through the IV, IV route as of now. No, not, not at least in this paper or whatever I could look at. Theoretically, it's possible because as we said, through uh, uh, it can go through body secretions. So body secretions would include body fluids, but uh, I don't think there are reports of uh, transmission occurring through blood transfusion as far as uh, I'm also aware, but no. theoretically but it is yeah, possible. It's possible. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think, yeah. If the viremic phase is there and that time the person donates the blood, then there is a possibility that yes, the, the infection can be transmitted. And that is one reason that what has been hypothesized that in pregnant women, there are two factors. One is the viremia is there and then there is a certain level of decreased immune uh, status, the immune response. So th in those situations, it can. Theoretically, it's quite, it's quite possible. But as uh, the Dr. Naj Mohan and Professor Guleria said that there are no published reports. As of now. So, I mean, to making a definitive conclusion or putting it that yes, this is the route of transmission also. That would be difficult for us to say as of now. But so as, we come, as, as we come to the guidelines and we talk of uh, infection and prevention control, it clearly mentions there that you should not donate blood during this period that you are suspected to have. And that is basically because of this, uh, uh, the factor that it could be transmitted through contaminated blood. So in continuity of one of the points that Professor Kaushal made was about the immune status. So the next question is, are people in an immune compromised state or those with HIV or full-blown AIDS more susceptible to getting infected? Of course. Yes, yes. yes. It you, won't make them susceptible to infection. I think, I think that, is, that is true for any infection actually. And, and the, the paper that we showed most of 41% uh, were retrovirus. <clears throat> so obviously, again, that is that is only one paper. One has not looked at other immunocompromised states. So there may be others like chronic kidney disease, steroid therapy, chemotherapy, malignancies, diabetes. So as, as we see more and more, I mean, maybe with time we'll come to look at that group of people as well. But yes, definitely the immune status will play a factor, will play a role. So immunocompromised patients definitely are at high risk and need to be looked at. There are other groups which have also been said should be monitored. One is uh, pregnant women and, and lactating mothers. And also children are below the age of eight years, I think, because there are also some data which suggest that it may have be more severe. But definitely those who are immunocompromised need to be monitored and they are the high risk group and uh, they need to be 
uh, sort of uh, looked at more carefully in terms of management. Uh, there are a number of questions on the sexual transmission mode. I think primarily because we have a lot of members from the RADVL here as well. So I'll, I'll club some of those questions together. Uh, how important is the sexual transmission? Can we call it an STI or is that stigmatizing the entire uh, infection and possibly also in bringing in complacency that people who don't engage in high risk sexual behavior would believe that we can't kill them? Sorry, we lost you. Can you read question or sir? Sorry, I'll repeat that. Uh, there are a number of questions related to the sexual mode of transmission. So the questions put together are how certain are we about the, how certain are we about the sexual mode of transmission? And is there any evidence or isolation of the virus from sexual fluid? And are we stigmatizing the Recipient or the people who've been infected by saying it's an STI, and therefore also bringing in complacency among others that since it's an STI, we can't be infected. So a bunch of questions related to the sexual mode of transmission. Uh, so I think we tried to answer some of that in the beginning in terms of the uh, issue of sexual contract and the uh, the stigmatization that may happen. I just ask uh, Kaushal Verma to just emphasize on that and try and answer the questions uh, from that point of view. Yeah, I think Susan, we have already uh, talked about this that. issue. This is a sexually say transmitted or sexually acquired infection. Primarily, it's a skin to skin contact, a close contact, a prolonged contact, which is important. So during the process of sexual contact, of course, you have a skin to skin contact, you have mucosal contact and you have a prolonged contact, which is what is making the transmission of infection from one person to another person easy, feasible and quick. So to say that this is the sexually acquired disease or sexually transmitted disease, I think that's a little premature for us to judge up now. So we need to understand that is a infective, uh, say disease. It's a, it's a it is an infective etiology disease, which is say getting infected, they're spreading from one person to another person through the close skin to skin contact. The mucosal areas can be the root of transmission and then the compromised skin can be the root of transmission. We are not sure that yes, if the intact skin can also be the root of transmission, but yes, the mucosal sites, if the infected material or the body fluids coming in contact, they, then the transmission of infection from one person to another person can easily occur. But to say this is sexually transmitted disease and stigmatizing a group of people are people, it is a disease which will occur in only in those individuals who are having, say, the high sex, high risk sexual behavior. That I think probably is uh, quite premature to say this. Yeah, I would tend to agree with that. So, you know, I think we should, I if we start saying that this is a purely sexually transmitted disease, we have we have two or three problems. One problem is that it will create issues in terms of being able to diagnose those who deny a history of sexual contact or who deny having a, a sexual contact with, uh, let's say, in the MSM group. So it is not correct that it is a sexually purely a sexually transmitted disease. There are other modes of trans, uh, transmission, and I think close contact is the important thing. The other important thing is that it would unnecessarily tend to stigmatize a large number of people which is uh, not required and this may create problems and we many of you have already seen what happened during the HIV uh, outbreak that it caused more problems in terms of uh, control of the disease and uh, in terms of how the patients who I suffered had, uh, had to really be, uh, get the burden. So please, I do emphasize this, I emphasized it at the beginning also that this is not a pure STD and we should not label it as that. Like many diseases, this can be transmitted through sexual route, but the main transmission is close contact, which may even occur, occur by hugging or being able to come, if you come in close contact with a in, uh, person who is infected and the skin comes uh, in contact and there is um, an open uh, a wound or an abrasion. So that is an important thing to keep in mind. So good afternoon, um, you know, Dr. Rajiv Kumar, I just had something to say. I'm Dr. Rashmi Sarkar. I'm the president of IDVIL. And first of all, I'd like to congratulate and thank both the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, as well as the Center of Excellence, AIMS, especially uh, Director Dr. Guleria Sir, 
Dr. Kaushal Verma and uh, so many of the other faculty for initiating this wonderful four uh, webinars on monkeypox, which is very much the need of the hour. Rather than doing it in a scattered way, I think this is one single very important take home message that has been is being reiterated. I could see by Kaushal Verma sir again and again that uh, we should we still have to know a lot about this disease. It is important to be vigilant and uh, we should not just straight away label it as a sexually transmitted disease because this is a query that has been coming up again and again. I think he's very nicely explained that it's more to do with skin to skin contact or with the phobites. And uh, so it's better not to stigmatize at this point of time. I think that is important because this question is coming recurrently, not only to all of us who are nodal officers, but also in the chat box. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we'll just take on a few more, more of a question. And we, since the uh, webinar today is primarily on epidemiology and global burden of disease, we're going to avoid questions which relate to other aspects, which are going to be covered in the webinars tomorrow or the day after. Uh, so the next question is that uh, is our vaccination and prevention. Is it currently recommended that vaccination be done? Or if so, which groups are recommended? And are people who, and is a smallpox vaccine still available in India? Okay, I think uh, these are questions that we'll actually come to when we talk of the management in terms of the availability of smallpox vaccine. Are there other vaccines that can be given uh, as far as monkeypox is concerned? And also the protection that the older people are having because of the fact that they have been already vaccinated uh, with smallpox. Uh, uh, in the 70s and early 80s. There is data which, which was there from the 60s and 70s from Africa, which showed that those who had had the smallpox vaccine were protected and had less severe disease. And I think the data suggested almost an 80% protection with smallpox vaccination. Uh, but obviously, since smallpox got eradicated, the, the vaccination production stopped. There's very limited production, which is being done only and being provided only to facilities where uh, healthcare workers are dealing with this virus or there is a fear of bioterrorism, uh, there is a, now an attempt to upscale the production of smallpox vaccination. But currently, this is not the topic that we're discussing today. We will discuss it on uh, the 12th of August when we talk of management and what can be done in terms of vaccination, its prophylaxis, uh, pre-exposure and post-exposure prophylaxis also. Right, sir. A couple of uh, queries about the spread to children or through children. So how severe is that, uh, significant is that concern that school children spreading it in schools and do we need to take specific precautions regarding children? Okay, so you want to know whether we should be, what precautions should be taken as far as children are concerned, especially those who are going to school. And uh, Anand, would you like to say anything? I, th I think the standard precautions which already we are following for coronavirus also applies there in a way because everything here depends upon the proximity of contact to uh, to an infection. So that again has to be there. But right now, I'm not very sure whether we can put anything specifically for monkeypox uh, alone because, you know, the mode of transmission we've already seen, it is respiratory droplets, fomites. Uh, animals, infected animals. So that is one precaution that can be taken, you know, to, to keep the animals, especially stray animals at bay. And apart from that, the standard precautions of preventing any close contact and any direct to direct face contact, the cuff etiquettes, etc. All these probably can still be reinforced. Thanks. Yeah, I would tend to agree with that. I think same precaution that we take for chicken pox. And to tell the parents, I would advise that if they have symptoms, then the child should not be sent to school, but stay at home and be isolated till the tests are done. Because as we've said, it's a close contact and droplet infection and can also cause the infection. So to uh, break the chain of transmission, as we do for COVID-19, it's better that the person is isolated and not does not come in contact uh, with others. And special precaution needs to be taken when the, the lesions appear on the skin, the rash appears and it goes through its various stages as far as the rash evolves, that needs to be taken. And that, again, we will discuss during infection control. But I'll ask Dr. Koshabram if he would like to say anything on this. Yeah, I think as of now, there seems to be no necessity of raising an alarm. The precautions which are in place for the COVID, they are good enough. 
the, if the children are using mask or if they are not coming in close contact, if they are not in the groups and if they, they, there is hardly any skin to skin contact, I think uh, we are uh, say reasonably safe as of now. But yes, it is important for us to understand that yes, the close skin to skin contact and prolonged skin to skin contact and compromised skin to skin contact, that is important. So for children, I think uh, the routine precautions should continue as Professor Valeria has emphasized and Dr. Anand also has said that there is no necessity as such to raise the alarm, but if there is a suspicion, if there is a child has less fever or there is any rash, then they should be uh, examined, maybe the doctor's uh, help should be taken to identify and they can be isolated. So I think I would really emphasize one point which Dr. Kaushal Verma has raised that currently we haven't reached a situation that we should have an alarm or we should start panicking. We should be vigilant and we should be aware of the disease and when to suspect and as clinicians what we should do. But I don't think that we should suddenly create, create an alarm because as we've said, the number of cases in our country are not that many. Secondly, it's not a disease which spreads so rapidly as does uh, COVID-19. And therefore, currently it does not seem that we'll have an outbreak of that, we, that we've had as far as COVID-19 is concerned. So I don't think there's a need in the general public to cause panic or alarm, but as physicians, we should be vigilant. So there is a webinar that we have next Wednesday, which will be specifically looking at prevention and infection control. So some of these issues may come up again in that webinar. We'll move on to one or two more questions specific to epidemiology and Indian epidemiology. And the question then is, do we know what is the current pattern of uh, infection in India? How many cases, where are they located? And how many of them have that data. been so the, the most of the symptoms are you know, constitutional. So they, they are they are presenting with fever, they are presenting with some chills, headaches, body aches, weakness, myalgia, and uh, and skin reaction and, and skin lesions. Now the skin lesions here are again very variable, and I think Dr. Verma will talk about that. They can be uh, very mild, and they are mostly on the face or on the extremities mostly. They can be starting from just macules or they can be, they can go on to become papules. They can sometimes, they can become pustules, they can crust. And then when they crust and after that, they dry off and heal, you know, the, that is the, the standard. So they are pretty much close to chickenpox in one way, although the distribution of uh, the, the rash may be slightly different. And then this also, these things all carry on and over say next two or three weeks, they gradually subside. Again, most of these are self-limiting and complications have been very, very rare, although some complications have been reported in the previous uh, studies like encephalitis, arthritis, etc. But they are again quite uncommon. Yes, and uh, as far as cases are concerned, uh, Dr. Kashmir, you want to say yeah, something? No, no, not really. I think the confirmed number of cases, as uh, Professor Guleria was trying to say, that's very limited. I think we have about seven or uh, maybe uh, yes. eight, cases eight cases so far right. confirmed. So the number that we are facing now is very small. And I think the important point that uh, I think we need to understand that every rash associated with fever is not monkeypox. We need to be careful that yes, there are several other viral infections or the febrile illnesses which can be associated with the skin rash. So we need to identify that yes, the viral, the fever is there and the rash is there. So what we have started seeing now, the people are coming, the patients are coming, they have got fever or maybe no fever and the rash is there and they're panicking if this is monkeypox. I think we need to understand that not every skin rash is monkeypox. We need to be discreet in the putting of that label and diagnosing monkeypox. It has to be associated with the other constitutional symptoms and then the rash is of a particular type and evolves over a period of time. Yes, so I think uh, as has also been put up on the chat box, we have nine cases and they are predominantly in Kerala and in Delhi. So it's not that they are spread all over the country and uh, except for very few cases, most of them have had a history of travel and then have turned out to be positive. So it's something which is seems to be uh, something which we need to keep in mind. I think there's one case where probably travel was not there, but again, uh, there is only one. Can I say a word, sir? Yes, please. Okay, I think someone had raised his hand and wanted to. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, sir, I am Dr. Vinit Ralan from Delhi. I am the nodal officer in Loknaik Hospital. So we had four confirmed cases from Loknaik Hospital. And none of them had any history of travel abroad. 
and three of the patients were uh, based locally in Delhi. Only one patient had history of travel to. Can you write this because we are not able to hear you? Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to say, sir, that four patients uh, were from our hospital in Loknayak Hospital, and nobody had a history of uh, travel abroad. Can you put it up in the chat box? Okay, sir. Sure. So I'll just reiterate what was said that four patients in uh, Loknayak Hospital, not, out of them, none had a history of travel abroad. One had a history of local travel only. Uh, so there is, there is another question, in fact, two questions related to epidemiology. Do we know why it's becoming a matter of concern this time around when there have been previous outbreaks as well? Is there a mutation? Has there been a change in something? Why is it more an issue now than in the past? So I think I'll ask Anand before he does that. I'll just say that I don't think there's enough data as far as mutation is concerned. As a, Dr. Anand Mohan had tried to show in that a fig, a diagram of his, travel and deforestation are two very important issues. And that is not only true for monkeypox, it's true for many other infections. We've seen a few years ago that outbreaks of Ebola also occurred. In other parts of the world, Ebola is an infection which occurred predominantly in parts of Africa only. But because of travel and people traveling in a very short period of time during the incubation period, the infection travels with them. And therefore, as travel increases, the world has become a global village. And we've seen that with COVID-19, we've seen that with SARS, we saw that with MERS, with Zika, with H1N1, that now viruses travel rapidly across the world and that is something we will have to live with. The second important issue is deforestation and important connection which is happening between animals and humans. So a lot of these viruses are zoonotic in origin. They jump species and man becomes an incidental host and then they evolve to develop good human-to-human -human transmission and then become almost like human viruses spreading to different humans. So this is another thing that we are going to see. And I've been saying this that this century, the last 22 years, has been a century of outbreaks and pandemics. We've had large number of outbreaks and pandemics, which we did not have in the last previous century. And that is related to, you could say, climate change, global warming, deforestation, encroachment, and of course, travel. So these are, I think, more important. But why has the virus mutated? I don't think we have enough data. Anand, anything from your side? Yeah, no, sir, nothing more. I think that that is the uh, crux of the thing. Microbiology still is evolving, so we don't know too much about the, the genetic component. Probably soon we will. And I think the causes for the increased number of cases have already been mentioned. If you see from the 70s to the 80s, there was nothing much, you know, just a couple of one or two odd cases here or there, even up to 90s. But it is from the uh, uh, 2000 onwards that there have been quite a few, even though sporadic, but quite a few cases. And the last two, three years, there have been two or three bigger outbreaks. So again, related to the various environmental and travel related factors, I would say, it is very easy to spread outside the zone of previous uh, endemic areas. So that is what is happening. And also the, I think the, the matter of concern has been that this was a disease which was limited to certain countries in the past. And now it has gone to 88 countries. And this is what is creating a concern that it is going to spread to other countries also. It is going to affect a large number of people. And this is what has created the situation and created a matter of concern. So now the virus has sort of jumped, come out of its box, if I put it that way. The yeah. box was Africa. Now the virus has come out of that box and has gone global. And therefore now it has become, rather than becoming endemic only in Africa, it's becoming endemic in other parts of the world and how that will change with time is something that is a cause of concern among epidemiologists, public health experts and the WHO. I think two people have raised their hands. Um, so if you have any comments, please. Uh, uh, so they're among the attendees. We will not be able to bring them on. There's somebody on the panel. Uh, the attendees will need to put it in the chat box. Uh, can antivirals be used? So I think we'll probably take that during the discussion that we have on the clinical presentation and management day after tomorrow. Among the epidemiology related questions, we've actually reached an end to what we have on the chat box and in the Q&A. So if there are any other comments that you'd like to add on to what we have today, so we have two, three more webinars coming up tomorrow on investigations, the after tomorrow on clinical management, and then next Wednesday on prevention. 
So Raji, we couldn't hear you. Just quickly. Uh, sir, we have no more questions on epidemiology. Questions. We have no questions on epidemiology. So we. So I would just like to say if there's any comments from the uh, uh, the participants who have uh, are part of the group, they may either put it on the chat box or or. Um, put on their cameras and then be able to give their comments or questions. Uh, this was the first of the series of four webinars that we're going to have. Uh, we'll make sure that the uh, internet is better next time because they, today we seem to have a little bit of an internet problem and connectivity is not as good as one would have liked it to be in terms of being able to uh, communicate with uh, the participants. But I think the key messages that we were wanting to give have actually gone through, both in terms of the fact that this is not a purely sexually transmitted disease. Uh, you need to be vigilant, but there is no need to panic. And at the same time, the cause of concern is because a large number of cases are now being reported in non-endemic areas. And in the future, this is something that we are going to see with other viruses also. There is a new viral outbreak reported in China. Again, so this is something which will continue. And this is going to be part of what medicine is all about. We will not now need to look at sort of travel medicine and global medicine rather than looking at only regional medicine. Any comments from my panelists? Uh, Thank you. I think uh, we would take it up further in the next uh, webinars. Yes. So many of the questions that have been on the chat box would be answered actually in, your, in the next three webinars. And then if you feel that there is something else that we need to cover, we'll try and do that also. But I think this is just the beginning to really sensitize everyone. And the first webinar was more from a sensitization point of view. But I'd also warn that we should become torch bearers and messengers as far as this disease is concerned to increase awareness among our physician colleagues and among the patients so that there's no panic. At the same time, we continue to be vigilant so that we don't really have a problem in the future. With that, I'll like to conclude. Uh, last comments by Rajiv, and if uh, Shri Lagaru, uh, Lagu, uh, Lava Garwal is there, then we can have a comment from the Ministry of uh, Health and Family Welfare. So we'll be back tomorrow at three o'clock, sir. We'll be having uh, the webinar will be on investigation and diagnosis, and Professor Lalit Dar will be presenting the diagnostic uh, toolkits. Three o'clock again tomorrow, and all this content is also available on the AIMS Telemedicine uh, YouTube channel. It's also archived there. So if you need to look at it later, it's available on the AIMS Telemedicine uh, YouTube channel. And I'm, also, and I'm sure there are other links that the ministry would also circulate where you could also access it later. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Any comments from the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare? Otherwise, we can close for today and meet tomorrow at 3 p.m. And sir, uh, Dr. Mr. Lava Agarwal had to. Okay. Thank you so much. So, fair enough. So, we meet tomorrow at 3 p.m. and tomorrow we'll discuss investigation and diagnosis. So, thank you very much. And we will try and answer and we'll answer all the questions that you put on the chat box on different days depending upon their relevance on that particular day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Record.